We're starting a Thanksgiving, a Thanksgiving series today. Um, I've called it Thanks and Giving. Uh, so we're going to be talking about thanking the Lord and giving. But as we prepare for that, as Thanksgiving's right around the corner, let me ask you a couple questions. When it comes to Thanksgiving, what is your favorite or fondest memories? What are your favorite or fondest memories? Um, we, we do something at, 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 uh, when we get together at my mom's house. We, we sit at the table. It depends. Sometimes we're sitting at the table depending on how many are there. If we've got a bigger group, we're circled up in like a prayer circle. And we go around the circle and, and everybody says something they're thankful for. And I always really enjoy listening to that, especially the kids, because they come up with some very interesting answers. Most of us as adults, we come up with the standard answers, you know, family and those kind of things. Kids come up with crazy answers and I really enjoy those. But I really enjoy doing that. Uh, not only that, but, but some of the fond things, some of the great memories of Thanksgiving is the food. We all love the food. Uh, you can tell that I love food, so um, we're all about the food. But really, one of my favorite things is gathering with family and friends and just sharing the day together. Just sharing the day, recognizing that God has blessed us, recognizing that God provides, thanking Him for all that, and thanking Him for our family and friends that we could just spend together. In fact, it's one of my favorite holidays for that very fact. There is nothing else except for just eating and fellowshipping with family and friends. And I just love it. I love it. Now, I know that some of you may have a little bit different view of Thanksgiving. It, it may be a stressful holiday. Maybe, maybe it's because you're preparing all the food, or maybe it's because you're trying to prepare the food that will please an in-law or, or something like that. Or, or maybe you uh, don't exactly see gathering with family and friends as a blessing. They're not really the blessing. The friends are, but the family part, not so much of a blessing. You're like, I don't, I don't know about that. Or maybe you just see Thanksgiving as a drudgery that you got to get through. You don't really like it that much, and you just got to get through it. And so you're over Thanksgiving altogether. You just had enough of it before we've even gotten to it. Johnny Carson, a former host of the NBC Tonight Show, offered this take on Thanksgiving. He said, Thanksgiving is an emotional holiday. People travel thousands of miles to be with people they only see once a year, and then they discover that once a year is way too often. So that's how many people are there. You know, in fact, I've entitled my sermon for today. Now, the series title is Thanks and Giving, but the sermon title for today is Thanks for Nothing. Thanks for Nothing. And some of you are thinking, yeah, preach it, brother. You bring it. Thanks for nothing. I'm not really that happy about this holiday. I'm not really that excited about having to get together with the family. I'm not really excited about having all of the food preparation placed on my back. Thanks for nothing. In fact, as I tell you the title, you might even be thinking to yourself, how is that even possible to say thanks for nothing? In view of all that God has done for us, in view of all the blessings that He showers upon us. In fact, one of the old songs He used to sing was count your many blessings. Remember how it goes? Count your many blessings Name them one by one. It, essentially, you were supposed to be remembering one by one what God has blessed us with. In fact, to, just to be honest with you, if we looked at just the blessings of today already, the one by one would be so many blessings. We, we just overlook them. But one by one by one, breath in our lungs this morning, the ability to get out of bed this morning, the ability to be here this morning, just blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing. So you hear thanks for nothing, and you think to yourself, how is that possible after all that God has shared with us, especially in light of the fact that He shared with us His Son, Jesus? So how do we give thanks for nothing? Well, we're going to look at some scriptures here, and you'll catch on here in just a second about what I'm talking about. But let's look at some scriptures. The first one's found in Mark chapter 6, verse 46. It says, after telling everyone goodbye, he went up to it, into the hills by himself to pray. Now, this is talking about Jesus. He has just fed the 5,000 men plus women and children, so probably 15,000 or so. But he's just fed all of them. And what does he do? He goes off by himself to pray. Now, keep that in mind. Luke chapter 6, verse 12. One day soon afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. <clears throat> this is right before the next day he starts naming off his, his 12 disciples. Uh, so before that, he, he's off with the Lord alone, praying by himself as he 
prepares to give that. Mark chapter 1 starts off, starts off right 35 verses into the Gospel of Mark, and it says this, Before daybreak the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. So I want you to understand that when you look at the example of Jesus, which is the very best example any of us could possibly live by, when you look at the example of Jesus, you recognize that Jesus play, uh, places a huge priority on alone time with God, which leads me to the first thanks that we need to give. Thanks for nothing that distracts. We ought to give thanks for nothing that distracts. Now Jesus <clears throat> gives us this example of being thankful for nothing. No distractions, just, just Him and the Lord. No, nothing fighting for His attention. Nothing bringing noise into His life. Nothing. He gets out with the Lord by Himself. There's some recent studies that have been done, and they show that taking time for silence restores, restores the nervous system. It, it helps us sustain energy. It conditions our minds to be more adaptive and responsive to the complex environments in which we live and work and, and have fun. Silence. In fact, Duke Medical School's uh, Emmerk Kirsty recently found that silence is associated with the development of new cells in the hippocampus, the key brain region associated with learning and memory. Physician Luciano Bernardi found that two minutes of silence inserted between music pieces proved more stabilizing to cardiovascular and respiratory systems than even the music category of relaxation. There's something important about silence, about quietness, about nothing going on around you. Jesus, I mean, God's Word tells us the same thing. In Psalm chapter 46, verse 10, we talk about this verse quite often. Be still and know that I am God. There's something about sitting back and recognizing and trusting that God has got this. There's something about being able to just sit back in the stillness and in the quietness and recognize that God is in control. In fact, a verse I preached, uh, a text that I used to preach a sermon about three weeks ago, was in 1 Kings chapter 19. It's Elijah, and he's disgusted, and he's upset with the Lord. And this is what it says. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And Elijah stood there. The Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And the voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah hears God in the whisper, in the whisper. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever spend time in a quiet enough place that you could hear God in a whisper, in a whisper. See, when there's no distractions, I believe it's much easier to hear God in the silence, in the alone time, when there's nothing around us fighting for our attention, we can come closer to the Lord. We can be more receptive to His leading. Can we say this morning that we're thankful for nothing? The nothing that gives us silence, that nothing that removes all the distractions. The nothing that Jesus himself sought after, he went out and deliberately found it. Are we thankful for that silence? Or do we try to avoid that silence? I heard about a group of studies they did. They were talking about silence. In fact, they asked each person to spend just 6 to 15 minutes on their own with, by themselves thinking with their own thoughts, just occupying themselves with their own thoughts. The founder of the study, the researcher Timothy Wilson of the University of Virginia told The Atlantic, he said, we like everyone else noticed how wedded people seem to be to modern technology and seem to shy away from just sitting, just using their own thoughts to occupy themselves. So in the course of these 11 experiments, these researchers were asking these people to spend the 6 to 15 minutes with their own thoughts 
In the first experiment, 58% of the participants said it was more than somewhat difficult to do it. In another experiment, 32% admitted to cheating by distracting themselves with their phone or music, etc. The most dramatic result was an experiment where the participants were hooked up to a machine designed to deliver a painful electrical shock. In fact, it was so painful that some who experienced it were willing to pay money so they could avoid having the shock the next time. And even with all of that, a quarter of the women and two-thirds of the men voluntarily shocked themselves rather than to be alone with their own thoughts. They would rather shock themselves than to have to be alone with their own thoughts. Have you ever noticed that not only do we not like silence, but we cannot be satisfied with a single distraction. Have you ever noticed that? You'll sit down in front of the television, and I'll have my tablet beside me and doing some things, you know, looking up some things that I might need for future reference, while I have my phone in my hand, and I'm either playing a game or surfing through Facebook, while I have a discussion going on, kind of, with my wife who's sitting in the chair next to me. TV on, tablet on, phone on, talking to her, kind of, and she's looking at her phone. That's how we live our lives. We don't want any kind of quiet time. Any kind of time where there's nothing going on, we don't like it. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, Jesus says this. He says, but when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father who sees everything will reward you. I'm in two different preachers group each week. If I can make it, I don't always make it to both. But anyway, one of them is on Thursday. The Thursday preacher group that we get together, we actually come up with a sermon series together that we're going to preach for the year. And uh, but, but most of our time in that that preacher's group is prayer. We spend time praying, uh, specifically for each other, but, but also including all different church things as well. But um, each preacher around the table will mention their prayer request, and then the person to their left will pray for them. As When they're all done, we all pray for each other, and we go around the circle. Last, It's over an hour long to, to, to get the request and then to spend the time in prayer. And as I was preparing for the sermon, I realized as I look back that I cannot think of a time in recent history where during the call, during the prayer time, and I'm talking about the actual time of prayer, not just the time of request, but the time of prayer when we're praying to God, I cannot think of a time in the last, I can't even think of when it was, the last time that someone didn't get a phone call in the midst of that. Now that wouldn't be so bad, you just silence your phone, set it aside, keep on praying. But I'm talking about someone getting a phone call, picking up the phone, walking over to the side, and answering the phone. Answer the phone. My, me included. Me included. Now think about that for just a second. We are talking to Almighty God, and for some reason, when our phone rings, we give priority to the person on the other end of the line rather than the Lord Himself. Any of you ever do the same? Sit there praying, and you got your phone in your hand, and if that thing vibrates even the least, you're like, someone might have commented. You're talking to Almighty God, and whoever's on the other side of that phone has got your attention. It's got your attention. Do you know when Beethoven was 30, he started losing his hearing. When he became 45, he had lost his hearing. He was completely deaf. In fact, at 45, he... he he considered committing suicide because he'd lost his hearing, but, but he did not do that. So after he was 45 and lost his hearing, he would take a pencil and he'd stick it in his teeth and he'd hold it to the soundboard of his piano while he played so he could feel the vibrations and feel the harmonies coming through that pencil into his, his mouth. And uh, it was after he was deaf that he produced the best music of his career. Uh, it culminated in the Ninth Symphony uh, composition, so daring and so new that it reinvented classical music altogether. Harvard professor author C. Brooks wrote, it seems a mystery that Beethoven became more original and brilliant as a composer 
in inverse proportion to his ability to hear. Deafness freed Beethoven as a composer because he no longer had society's soundtrack in his ears. Instead of running from the silence, maybe we ought to embrace it and thank God for not having distractions. Thank the Lord that we have a time where society's soundtrack is not playing over and over and over again in our ears and in our minds. Silence is not the only thing we should be thankful for. Thankful for no distractions. The next one is found in Luke chapter 22. Now I put a scripture on the, on the thing, and it's the wrong scripture. I don't know what I was thinking. So it's in Luke chapter 22, and it's Jesus' prayer. I'm going to quote it to you. Jesus said to the Lord, he calls out to the Lord, if it's possible, please take this cup of suffering from me, but not my will, but yours be done. That's what Jesus calls out to the Lord. Philip Yancey talking about that prayer. He says, when Jesus prayed to get the one who could save... <laughs> Excuse me, let me read this again. When Jesus prayed to the one who could save him from death, he did not get that salvation. He got instead the salvation of the world. The second thing we need to be thankful for is we need to be thankful for nothing happening in prayer. We need to be thankful for nothing happening in prayer. Now, I'm not talking about all prayers. I understand that. Please be aware of that. But when we pray, we ought to be thankful sometimes that there is no answer, at least not the answer we want in that prayer. Now, the problem is when prayer isn't answered the way we want, we automatically start to get upset with the Lord. We start to complain to God, why aren't you answering me? Are you not listening to me? Why aren't you providing for what I've asked you for? And we can be angry in this. But Jesus displayed a blessing of not having our prayers answered, not having it the way we want it anyway. He wanted to escape the terrible death of the cross. He wanted to escape having to become my sin and your sin and all mankind's sin. He wanted to escape being separated from God. Yet Jesus was willing to accept God's answer, whatever His answer was. In fact, God's answer was no to Jesus as far as a personal rescue was concerned. But yes, to a rescue of all people through Him. Now, we need to be careful. Sometimes we ask prayer requests. We Sometimes we pray out to the Lord and we expect an answer. But if we actually got what we asked for, it would be detrimental to us. It would be a problem to us. In Hebrews chapter 12, it goes on. We're, we're familiar with this verse. It says, we do this in keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in a place of honor beside God's throne. I, I find that so interesting. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is praying that the cup could be taken from him, but not his will, God's will. I understand. But then in Hebrews 12, it records that he could look past the cross and find a joy in seeing what God would accomplish through the no to his prayer. What about you and me? Can, can we look past our request and just trust that God's going to accomplish something better, greater than we could possibly think of? That we could possibly have dreamed He could? You ever prayed for someone to be healed and they weren't healed? Sometimes I wonder to myself, God, why didn't you just heal that person? Why didn't you provide for them? Why did they have to die? And then I wonder to myself, but I don't know what may have come if they'd have lived on. Maybe they had to endure something terrible, something tremendous. We can't see that. And I do know this, no matter what happens, where's the best place we could possibly be? In the presence of the Lord. And boy, I'm looking forward to being face-to-face -face in that presence. Timothy Keller talks about prayer. He says, I prayed for an entire year about a girl I was dating and wanted to marry, but she wanted out of the relationship. All year I prayed, Lord, don't let her break up with me. Lord, don't let her break up with me. Of course, in hindsight, it was the wrong girl. I actually did what I could to help God with the prayer. Because one summer, nearing the end of our relationship, I got a location that made it easier for me to see her. And I was saying, Lord, I'm making it easy as possible for you. I've asked you for this, and I've taken the geographical, geographical distance away. 
But as I look back, God was saying, Son, when a child of mine makes a request, I always give that person what he or she would have asked for if they knew everything I know. If they knew everything I know. Have you ever been able to look back at a prayer that you made that was answered with a no or not yet and realize just what a blessing it was that it wasn't answered the way you wanted it? Just what a blessing it was that God didn't say yes to what you asked for? In, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says this, The Lord isn't really being slow about His promise as some people think. No, He is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Have any of you ever prayed, Lord, come back today? Lord, I want you to come back today. You are facing a big test. Lord, I want you to come back today before I have to take that test. Lord, I want you to come back today before I have to go through that surgery. Lord, I want you to go back, come back today before this person I love passes away. Lord, just come back today. Have you ever thought about that? Let this verse sink in for just a minute. Because as I was looking at it, it just really struck me. It really struck me. God may be saying no, or not right now, to our prayer for Him to come back today so that it gives someone else a chance to escape eternal death. You ever thought about that? You ever thought about that? In fact, this scripture's been around, we're just going to round up to 2,000 years. You ever think anybody back in the day was praying, Lord, come back today? Lord, come back today before they put me on that pile and light me up as, as, uh, to light up the city. Lord, come back today before they put me out in the Colosseum where they're going to eat, eat me, where the animals are going to attack me and eat me. Lord, come back today before I have to shovel out this pig pen uh, you know, that my wife's getting on me about, you know, whatever. We've often asked ourselves, I, I hear these questions all, all the time, why, why let all the trouble go on, Lord? Why, why allow all the suffering to go on, Lord? Why, why allow death to continue, Lord? Well, why are you allowing evil to gain control, Lord? Why aren't you solving this problem by coming back? And the, and the answer to that is, because He's patiently giving people time to come back to Him. Could it be that you and me and our families and friends were given the time that the Lord wanted to give us so that, so that we could come to Him? He was patient with us, even though other people were praying for Him to come back while we were outside a relationship with Him. See, this morning as we start this series out, I think it's so important that we understand that there are some things that are that we need to thank God for that we didn't get. Some things that we need to thank God for that He didn't answer the way we wanted. In fact, today I want us to understand that thanking God for nothing, that, that's going to be a good thing. Nothing going on so that we can spend time with Him. Nothing going, going on so that we will be undistracted in our time of conversation with the Lord. That, that's a good thing to pray about. That's something to be thankful for. Thankful that, that, that our prayers aren't always answered because we trust that God knows what's best. We trust that He can see the plan be farther than we can. And we trust that He will provide even when we hear a no or not now. Sometimes it's important for us to thank Him for the nothing in our life. We pray with me? God, thank You for this time together. I, I thank You that we did spend our uh, time in the Lord's Supper just in some silence with You. That wasn't coordinated, Lord, but You coordinated it. You, you, you worked all that out. But Lord, we, we thank You for that. I thank You for that. And Lord, I pray that all of us could embrace those times of quietness. And instead of filling them with some distraction that we manufacture so we don't have to spend time with our own thoughts or with You, I pray, Lord, that we would embrace them and learn to enjoy that time with you. And Lord, the same, I pray the same for prayers that we feel weren't answered the way we want, that were answered with a no or a not now. I pray, Lord, that, that we could recognize that you not answering them, nothing happening the way we want is, is, is okay because you see things that we can't see and you provide in ways that we trust will always work out for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So Lord, I come today and I thank you for nothing, no distractions. 
prayers that aren't always answered the way I want because I trust you. And I pray for all of us that we can do the same. Thank you, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.